Are you doing the Aki Conference one too? You can try. I'm trying. <laughs> All right, carry on. Okay. Uh, welcome to our very special um, event that we have today. It's part of the Sea Ice class, Applied Earth Sciences, and um, we're excited to be talking to an alumni, Missy Holzer. She's been with uh, Polar Trek in the past and she agreed to um, give the uh, teacher side of working with scientists in earth science. Um, and today's event is August 7th, uh, 2012, and we're going to um, be archiving this and so it will be available for those people that aren't presenting and are participating today. So a few things about the platform that we're using. Um, it's called Blackboard Collaborative. And um, some of you that joined a little bit earlier might have been playing around with it, but slides should be changing in the center of the screen for you. And you, um, as we go along, you should get a new visual. It shouldn't take too long. Um, when it comes time to asking questions, um, you can let us know that you want to ask a question by clicking on the little hand icon. It's just above the list of participants. And that raises your hand and lets us know you have something to say. And then when you get a chance to talk, you can, um, if you're using Voice over IP, you can click on the talk button once. That opens up the mic. And then you say what you want to say. And then make sure you click it one more time um, to finish talking and close the mic out. Um, of course, you can uh, share your emotions with us. You can give us applause. You can type in questions in the chat area um, or share information down there. And um, if you're on the phone, which I don't think anyone is, you would just star six to your phone or six to unmute it. Again, this is being um, archived, and we'll put the link on our website as well as share it through the Sea Ice course participants. So why why Sea Ice? Why um, Missy and Polar Trek? What's going on there? Um, so Polar Trek is a National Science Foundation funded program. Um, it's designed to place teachers with researchers in the polar regions um, with, on field-based research experiences. And Missy will certainly talk about where she went with us um, a couple years ago. Um, we have some uh, funding from 2010 to 2013. And with that funding, we're hoping to place about 50 teachers from around the United States in the polar regions. And, uh, Sea ice is just one way that we hope to share what we're what's going on in the polar regions with those of you that can't go out to the polar regions. Um, there's a, a slide about questions. Again, if you have a question during the presentation, you can raise your hand by clicking on that icon, or of course you can type it in the box. And we'll turn over to here to Missy, and while she's presenting, we'd like you all to introduce yourselves in the chat area. Tell us who you are, maybe what you teach, and where you're from, or what you, why you're taking this class, or attending today. What, what's your interest? And um, with that, we're going to turn it over to you, Missy. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. And I'm delighted to be here with you this evening. I've been watching along with uh, the class and, and the dialogue that's taking place. And it seems like you guys are just about as passionate as I am, um, if not more, about the polar regions and the great science that takes place up there. Um, what I'd like to do uh, today is talk to you a little bit about my experience up there and how it actually got back into the classroom. Oops. Um, are we going to take a couple seconds to introduce each other? First, uh, Missy, that's okay. You can go along, and then maybe we'll. Um, do you, unless you want us to go around, Robin, do you want to go around so that you know where everybody's coming from? Sure, let's do that. Uh, we'll take a couple seconds to do that, then we'll move on. Thanks. Okay. So um, yeah, I don't think we have too many people here. We could do that. Um, so for those of you that have voice over IP, we'll start with that. Um, if you might, don't mind, we'll start at the top of the list. Barbara, um, introduce yourself and say hello. Um, click on the talk button once and again to close the mic. Hi, everyone. I'm Barbara Rowe. I'm a middle school science teacher at Mulligan Township Schools in southern New Jersey. I'm interested in potentially um, using 
Um, Polar Tech as a tool in my classroom. I've attended two Earth Watch, mis uh, Earth Watch missions uh, in Vietnam and in England, and I'm interested in um, possibly either going to the Arctic or Antarctic, uh, any of the polar regions, to continue my research and bring what I learned back in the classroom. Hey, excellent. Okay, next, Julia West. Hey guys, I'm Julia West. I live in northern New York State. I teach um, high school science through distance learning to homeschooled kids all over, pretty much all over the world actually, and uh, biology, environmental science. And my goal is um, just to learn more about the polar regions, which I find just great learning. You know, it's good for kids to know what's going on there because there's so much happening. And also I want to learn more about web-based learning and try to connect our students a little better. Thanks. All right. And uh, Madalena, I don't know if your uh, microphone's working. Um, if it is, go ahead and speak. Oh, she's running like there. That's what that is. It doesn't work. Okay. So if you can hear me, uh, Madalena, please introduce yourself in chat area. And we'll go on to Michael Dempsey. How you doing? Um, Mike Dempsey. I'm from upstate New York, a uh, small town uh, called Poplar Ridge. Uh, I teach uh, earth science and physics and eighth grade science. Uh, I'm looking to use this course uh, as a uh, part of my climate uh, 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 studies at the end of the year. So uh, hopefully we get, get quite a bit for that. Thanks. Hey, welcome, Michael. Nancy, go ahead. She's typing. So, and she said she was a 7th to 8th grade science teacher from Illinois, and maybe she'll add on to that. So while she's typing, we're going to go on to Sue. You want to use your mic? Working. Um. Yes, Sue, it was working. OK. I'm Sue Zupko. I teach the gifted in Alabama, in Huntsville, Alabama. I'm interested in science. My Kids are very interested in my travels. I've been around the world as a teacher doing different activities. And this year, my whole topic is change. So it kind of fits with the Polar Trek um, experience. I did teacher at sea, so I'm very interested in doing authentic research. All right, welcome to uh, Tammy. Go ahead. Hi everyone, I'm Tammy. I teach uh, down in South Florida, both marine science and biology. And I'm looking to get more information about climate change so that I can integrate it into my marine science courses this year and hopefully in the future. OK, excellent. And Turtle, I'll have, I know your mic's not working, so if you haven't done so, just introduce yourself in the text. And same with uh, Madalena. I see you're trying to come in as a second time there. So introduce yourself in the chat, and we'll turn this back over to Missy. Go ahead. OK, we're going to move on. Yep, I'm all here, ready to go. Um, welcome, everyone. And um, so let's go ahead and move on. Now, the, the first slide I, I put up here, um, i got to tell you, it was really difficult to weed out the slides. I had to go from close to 100, um, and I couldn't get down to what Sarah and Janet wanted. So, so I might have to talk a little bit on the quicker side to get through them all. Um, but the, the slides that I left out were some of the great slides that uh, really gave you a sense as to what it's like to be up in the Arctic and, and what it's like to prepare to go into the field. Um,
Um, so I thought, you know, um, I think Dan is doing a phenomenal job of posting slides and telling some great stories of what it's like to be up there. So I'm going to just direct you over to his journal and to my past journal to, to take a look at some of the pictures there and really get a sense of what it was like to be up there. Um, I chose, though, to put this one in here because um, Al made it sound as if um, I had an issue with, with the guns and, and shooting and all that. But I've got to tell you, I'm the one that won the candy bar. I'm the one that had the four bullseyes. Um, enough said. <laughs> Um, but that that was a little bit of a challenge. Um, I tell you, sh shooting a gun was uh, a little bit difficult for me. It's kind of a little bit on the emotional side. First off, you're shooting into a, a glacial uh, structure called a cirque, and so it, the the sound just totally is it amplified. Even though you have earphones uh, phones on, um, it was just a, a phenomenal sound. It was it was pretty frightening. Um, but once I got my my wits about me um, and somebody coached me on how to do it, it wasn't so bad. Um, anyway, here's a quick little outline of what I'd like to cover this evening, and I would like to give you just a little bit of an overview. Um, I know Al did a fantastic job doing that, as did um, Dan, um, but I'll perhaps add a little bit more to what they gave you already. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the field research as well as a little bit about the data, and I think it's important to introduce you a little bit to the kids, because you'll see where that is going to take what I did and how it got me back into the classroom and, 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 and beyond. Okay, so here we go. All right, um, I grabbed this map from um, the, this um, Arctic Atlas, and I gave it as I sent it as one of the websites for you guys to take a look at. So um, I just suggest that um, when you get a chance to play around with those websites, and um, a gentleman by the name of Bob Odo, who was also on this expedition years prior, developed a nice little lesson that goes with this uh, map as well as the other maps in this suite of maps. Anyway, what this what I liked about this uh, art, this um, um, graphic is that it gives you a number of definitions of what the Arctic is all about and how we can define the Arctic. You can see that it's been defined um, by the level of permafrost. It's been defined by the, where the Arctic Circle is situated, and as well as um, by temperature range. Um, so depending upon who you are and the type, perhaps the type of science that you do, you might have one definition of the Arctic versus another. Okay. This just give you a little bit of a sense. Might want to be taking notes and grabbing lots of information, and we can stay a little longer than an hour if we need to. Okay. Okay, no problem. Um, I'll, I'll back it up just a little bit. Just uh, you know, I'll keep an eye on the chat, and if I am going too fast, just uh, tell me to slow it down. Um, Oh, let's see. What, oh, um, going back to Sue had a question. Why would you shoot into the ice? Actually, the, it, we, what we shot at, go back to that picture, uh, were, were these posters of polar bears. And I think that was kind of uh, a little bit heart shaking, too, because, you know, polar bears are these big, white, fuzzy animals. Um, but actually, what we were doing is, is shooting at the poster of the polar bear. Um, and it was, uh, it, we had to shoot at the shoulder of the polar bear. Um, so the, the surf, this, this glacial structure that looks like an amphitheater, was just lined up with all these posters of polar bears. Um, I'm sorry I gave the misconception that we were actually shooting into the ice, uh, but we are actually shooting at posters of polar bears. Okay. Okay. And Oh, I'll definitely slow down. Um, so again, going back to this this uh, graphic from the, the from the Arctic. Um, so just uh, if you just kind of follow the lines here, you can see that, and the different shades of gray, you can pick up on the different colors of the permafrost, um, the permanent permafrost or continuous versus the discontinuous permafrost, um, as well as the Arctic Circle, the 10 degree um, isotherm, um, and as I mentioned, that this website actually has a number of additional maps that you can use for teaching um, teaching strategies in the classroom. Okay. okay, and so back on to the temperature. So this is giving you, and I know somebody posted, I think Madalena, I think you po actually posted this, the link to the website that had this, this graphic in there. Um, and I like that website one uh, uh, tremendously because it does give you a nice sense of the geography of Svalbard and, and the region that we were in. What uh, this one gives you in the top line, you're looking at the precipitation. And you can see that there's not that much precipitation. It's almost not quite a desert region um, as it would be defined, but it, the precipitation wasn't that low. 
what gives you the sense that the precipitation was high is that there's a lot of drifting with the wind. And so therefore, you see that it looks like the snow perhaps is pretty deep, whereas it actually is not. Uh, the green line, you're looking at the summer t high. In the winter, you can see the, the temperature is a little bit, it fluctuates a little bit more. And then the black line will give you the mean annual temperature. OK. When we were there, just to kind of give you a sense of, of temperature for myself, I likened it when people ask me to the temperatures that we have in New Jersey in the winter. Um, and I'm at about 40 degrees north latitude here. So we would have to dress in layers and um, just be prepared for any kind of elements. We had our days where the temperature was quite raw and it felt uh, very uncomfortable. But then again, you know, if you packed with layers, it wasn't such a bad deal. OK. Um, something that um, Dan alluded to, but I don't know, you really get a sense of, of what it's like up there unless you actually live it and you've actually been in, these po in the polar regions. If you had the opportunity to get above the Arctic Circle in the summertime, um, then you know what I'm talking about here. What we're looking at here is a graphic of the, the uh, 24 hours of daylight that they get up there. So um, I put today's date in there. And you can see that even today, there is 24 hours of light. Um, but the, what we end up seeing during the course of our time there, because we were there for quite a bit of time, is that the sun angle actually changes a little bit as the, as the season progressed closer and closer to autumn. Um, but going back to just kind of reiterate what Dan was talking about is that we, it's, with 24 hours of light, you're just, for me, I just felt energized the whole time I was up there. Woke up, you know, the sun was out. Um, it was almost difficult to, to quit working. Um, so there were evenings I was working, it was past midnight, and I look outside and you have clear, clear blue skies. And so it was, it was quite odd to be in a situation where you had 24 hours of light and, and you just didn't know when to stop working. Um, but it was a, a wonderful experience. OK. Um, this map gives you a little bit about the, ge the geology of the area. And I know, again, Dan talked a little bit about um, the geology. But this actually will maybe put in perspective some of the things that he was showing you. And you can see that where we were, Kaplan A, where, where the circle is, you can see that the geology there is, is quite diverse. Um, I think um, Dan actually showed you, and he and Mike were actually hiking out, with, out where the, the, to show you changes in sea level, as well as the uh, sedimentary rocks that they have in some of those layers there. Um, to continue with the sedimentation, um, sedimentary layers and just kind of the age of this whole region, there, there's quite a bit of coal up there. And that tends to be a resource that's mined quite a bit. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure, but I believe the Russians are the last group that's there mining out the coal uh, that's left within the sedimentary layers. Um, so that's the geology. And then I love this one for the topography because I just love hiking. And for me, um, a good. Uh, a good um, hike is, uh, is, is, is and a little bit of steepness is, is, is one of my best friends. Um, so I have where we stayed. And then you can see the kind of the, the circles. You kind of get a sense as to where Dan and, and the team are at this summer. Um, you can see their hike going from where we stayed at the station all the way up to Lene Brain, which is the, the glacier. Those are the long days. Um, the shorter days, you can see that we're going over to the far end, uh, the southern end of um, uh, Kaplan A, and then you can see that the circle Congress uh, Vatnet is where the additional lake was, where they're also collecting sediments as well. Okay, so um, what is this? Oh, um, let's see. Let's go back. Um, so on days, let's see. Usually we did about. Is it about, uh, let me, I'm trying to recall. It's probably in my journal. Um, I think it's about a 13-mile hike round trip to Lene Breen, and then about eight miles a day, um, uh, five to eight miles a day if we're going to the end of the lake, which is where we did most of our data collection. But then since you're in the field, there's a ton more data collection that needs to be taken within the within Lene Dolan, where, where we had it completely wired, and where we had all these sensors that we had to go maintain. So once you get there, you're not done. And besides getting back, there's a ton of hiking that takes place in between. So for me, you know, there's numerous reasons why this was the absolute perfect fit for me. One of them is my passion for hiking. And then you'll see the second passion coming in a second.
Yes, all the gear had to be hauled as well. So um, we were told to bring ba uh, big uh, backpacks uh, because all the equipment that is out in the field now has to go back to its fjord radio or it has, and then if some of it gets packed and stays there, and then additional equipment needs to go back onto the boats and then ship back over to uh, Longer Beam. Um, but yes, on a daily basis, um, we all had loads. And, and lunch took up a bit of space as well because we had to pack pretty substantial lunches and um, other to keep ourselves uh, nourished during the day. Okay. Well, going back to chocolate. So these were all the pictures I left out. Going back to chocolate, um, there was nothing better in the middle of the afternoon than when it was cold out and your feet, you need that extra little bit of kick to get the, the legs going to get yourself home for dinner. Um, but some warm tea, because if you have a good thermos, your tea is still warm. That little bit of chocolate, and for me, I had little cups of peanut butter. So for me, it was the peanut butter, chocolate, and a little bit of warm tea, and I was ready to go. Um, and that was just enough to kind of get me that little bit of extra energy for the rest of the afternoon. Um, the funny thing is, though, when I got home, um, chocolate and peanut butter um, never really tasted the same. So I, have, I think it has something to do with the cold Arctic air that makes them taste really extra special. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I'd like to put this slide out there um, just to kind of give a sense as to you know, why the polar regions are so important. And for anybody who's studying equatorial regions, they'll probably put a similar slide up here and talk about the equator. And the climate change, you know, we have, we're having in the United States a, 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 a strong faction that are really not sensing that cli the climate is actually changing. Um, and all you need to do is just kind of step outside actually this summer and, and the, pa the recent you know, past 10 years here in our area, or we just go right up into the polar regions and you really do know that it's changing. Um, when I do this presentation and I have a little bit more time, what I do is I show this video called Owning the Polar Crisis. Um, I'm going to suggest I put it in the resources for the course. Um, I highly suggest that you watch that and please use it in your repertoire if you're going to be teaching about the polar regions. I think it's a nice little kickoff because it talks to the lay people because uh, the lay people don't have a sense as to why we want to study, study the polar regions and then it pulls in the scientists and say, hey, hey, there's a lot taking place up there that we need to be aware of and the climates are changing. Um, so for us, what, um, why Svalbard is so wonderful is that it was just it's just a, a wonderful laboratory. You know, it's just ready and willing for us to come up there with instrumentation to gather data. Okay. Now, um, what, uh, then this, this next little section is just to kind of introduce you to a little bit of the data. Um, Al did a fantastic job explaining the whole VARV collection and how what, uh, the story that VARVs can tell. Uh, but that's only a little bit of the data. Dan is introducing you to some more of the data with the kids. Um, and perhaps I can introduce you to a few more pieces of data that were collected up there. And the idea here is perhaps maybe I can spark an, an idea or two for your capstone uh, projects. Okay, so this is kind of the, the um, topographic map kind of turned around a little bit and the areas um, that we have, um, I have pointed to are the, our study areas. And in the bottom right hand corner of the, the, the image is where is your radio is. So you can see that, you know, kind of following that red line for Lenevon, is that, that's our kind of our hiking path as we hiked, hiked, hiked uh, to the edge of the, where the arrow tip is at the lake, got into the, the boats and then sailed over to the end and then and that's where we did began all of our work. Okay, um, just to go back to this, just to kind of give you a sense as to some of the uh, sensors that are out there. Um, the, up in the, just kind of going up to the glacier area, uh, we had a whole big stake network. Um, and so we can actually, they're called ablation stakes, and we can actually see changes in the snow level um, during the course of the, the five weeks that we were there. Um, there are meteor meteorological stations all along this, this region inside um, from the lake over to the glacier. Uh, we had a couple glacier clam clams. One that was up by the glacier and another one that was over by the lake that is actually looking at the edge of the lake where the meltwater flowed into the lake as well as looking at a patch of, um, of the, this hillside over here on this side. Um, so in the, in the lake itself, um, you, you know from Dan's um, postings that there are a number of moorings that were kind of scattered throughout the whole lake. Uh, collect and then those, the moorings were just laden with sensors, electronic sensors, um, as well as those sediment traps that he's been talking about. 
Um, and so and to give you a little bit of a sense as to the types of instruments that were out there. The moorings, the, the red pegs is where we have all the moorings um, situated. And there's the temperature loggers that were in there as well as conductivity. Um, and as well as the sediment traps all connected to it. Um, the things that you see on the side, those white little pieces um, along the way, those would be the sediment traps on the side. And Dan, I think, showed a nice picture that they were all attached to a rock, so that's the weight that kept it down at the bottom of the lake. And then they had the yellow uh, floaters on the top. Um, we used um, GPSs as well as um, GPSs to locate the, the uh, moorings the following summer. Many of them were covered with a, a bit of silt already, uh, maybe a little, and, and they were just difficult to see. Uh, but once we did see it, it was like finding, um, finding a treasure, and we were able to retrieve them and, and pull up the sensors. Um, yes, by the way, that picture was from around 1936. OK, so the plume cam, um, there's a series of pictures that go with the plume. And from that, we can actually see um, the time, at the, the way the plumes were actually coming into the lake. And down here, this is the, uh, the, the, the meltwater. And you can see it kind of flowing into the lake. Um, and a little bit of a difference there. And then so this is just kind of gives you a sense as to why it's important to have those moorings with the sediment traps at different heights in the water. Um, because you, you're gonna, your, your sediments are just going to be very different across the whole water column. And this is a wonderful way of assessing uh, the turbidity of the water as the water was coming in. It was very stratified. OK. Um, now, I put this graphic up here um, because just to kind of give you a sense as to that there's a lot of data that we can collect. And you can see that none of the lines are straight. And so within this, we have stories that are being told and stories that are mysteries that need to be solved. One of the activities that I came up with back in the classroom is I took each one of these data sets and made a, a group set of them. So I had one for the conductivity, one for lake level, one for temperature, one for turbidity. I gave each one of these <coughs> to groups of students as well as the metadata. And then the students, what they did is they actually generated a series of observations about each set of lines. Um, and then from those observations came up with inferences about what they think happened uh, to produce the line that they see over time. So this is a way of slowly introducing the, the data to the students without overwhelming them with a picture that looks like this. This can, I think, overwhelm even the, the, the most apt scientists because there's just so much going on. Um, but then what we do after we look at each in data set individually is take the next step. Well, let's start putting them together. Let's see if one story helps us, one story helps add to the, the continuation of another story. Does the conductivity and the turbidity, is there a relationship between them? So it, it's a very slow process with the kids, but you know what? That's what science is about, is trying to unravel this data, see if we can actually pull a story out of it. So that that's one thing to do. If the data is accessible, I know Dan had posted one data set for you, uh, but perhaps the other data sets will be available for you as well. If not, um, shoot me a line, shoot me a note, and I'd love to um, send these data sets out to you. I'm pretty sure that I still have them available, and I wouldn't mind sharing them with you. OK. Um, so this picture looks a little bit familiar. It's the one that Al had last week with his uh, webinar. Just to remind you that barbs were, um, data, were pieces of data that we had collected out there. But one of the things to show is this little bit of a change over time with the, the VARBs. So, so what we're looking at here is normalized precipitation from 1965 to 2005. And that's your June, July, and August, so that's summer. And you're looking at VARB thickness. And already, we can start seeing a relationship between the two, that there is a relationship between the thickness of the VARB in the summertime and the, and the, temp and the precipitation rate. OK, um, so we had a weather station that was out there. One of the tasks that we needed to do was to collect and download all the data. And then the second thing we needed to do was to make sure we changed out the batteries and all so that the data is continuously being collected year round. 
Okay, and so what this is showing you is a relationship between temperature and precipitation. This one, I think, um, is a, probably a nice entry level graph. Um, so you have a time along the bottom, and then you have you have your temperature in red and your rainfall in um, in uh, blue. And you can see that we have um, the zero. So you have this black line is your zero mark for um, for temperature. Um, so you can start kind of pulling the the weather. You can start comparing data and weather to see if there's a relationship. Or you can use this data to kind of assist you with other data sets. Again, um, we would be able to, you know, I would be able to provide these for you. Or Dan might have uh, the same type of data he can get you for 2012. What might be interesting is to compare the 2008 data with the 2012 data. Okay, um, this one uh, is, a, is a temperature tree, a, what we call a snow tree. And the graphic that goes with this, they usually have it animated, and it's a white bar that shows how it's covered, and then how, um, how the line, you know, the, the, the tree gets covered during the course of the winter. So this whole tree, this little tree here, is totally covered when the snow comes out. The star in the map gives you a sense as to where it was, um, where it was placed. And then this was the data that we got from the snow tree. And you can see that what we had in the fall is that the temperatures got cold and as the snow is falling. And then you can see over the course of the winter time, the, the temperatures were isothermal. But then you can see, if you zoom into the graph, um, that was one of the graphs I pulled down, unfortunately, you can see which, which rung of the tree started heating up. So you can almost get a sense as to how quick the snow melt actually occurred until the whole snow tree was actually um, uncovered. Okay, um, Alice explained a little bit about what Svalbard REU is, and REU stands for Research Experience for Undergraduates, and it gives a few, the kids experience. There's all kinds of REUs. Um, there's not just the one for the polar regions, but instead there's um, REUs uh, for all different types of sciences. But the whole point of them is to get our undergrads some experience of actually doing science. Um, and so in this case, the big thing was to get them into the field and, and get, them, um, get them jazzed up with uh, doing some polar research. Um, so the, the, pro the idea here is for all of them to come up with their own research projects. Many of them have mentors that were back at their universities, and so they collaborate and they design something with them, and then they come into the field with perhaps their research question well-defined or perhaps not well-defined, and I'll explain what that means in a second. So they collect the data in the in the season, and then they take this um, they take this uh, the data back with them in the fall, and then usually during the course of the, the year, they'll either finish up their data collection, data number crunching in the fall, and then have their their thesis completed by spring. Okay, this is our gang. Um, oh, in our case, we had uh, three students from UNIS, and then the balance of us were from um, the U.S. The balance of students were from the U.S. Um, I want to give you a little bit of a sense as to what they did here, because again, when developing your capstone course, your capstone activities, you might not even be thinking about a project related to some of the data that's there um, it, until you start you still until you meet all these kids. That was one of, I think, a, a, well, many favorite things about this trip. But one of them was that there were so many kids doing all different things. And from them, I learned new science from all 10 of them. Um, I, I learned how to apply new scientific methods because of all 10 of them. Um, and so the, the, this, the, uh, the ability to learn, this was probably the, I'm going to suggest and probably the best of all of the polar experiences. Um, but I bet I'll have some of my colleagues who went on the other trips differ with that. So just to kind of give you a little bit of a sense as to what some of these kids did, we had one student that was looking at isotopes. He was looking at um, cosmogenic isotopes. And what that was was um, just looking at the timing of the Little Ice Age. And so the, the rock, the um, the igneous rock that are up there, there's uh, some granites that are up there. Um, when they're exposed to sunlight, they absorb some of the solar radiation and some cosmogenic nuclei. And from their exposure, the, 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 um, the cosmogenic nuclei tend to break down. And so you can actually use them as a kind of like a, for chronology. You can actually use them as a time clock. And so that was what um, Anthony was doing there. A little bit quicker, we were looking at um, we were looking at the elevation lines for the Little Ice Age. 
uh, that was Stephen. Kristen was the one that hiked out to the glacier. Um, I think she was out there like three times a week to measure the glacial ablation. Um, so what she needed to do was take a look at the stakes and see how they were being exposed um, more and more during the course of our season. She also needed to look at, at the discharge in the stream for the meltwater. And so we found that she had to get into those, yellow, those orange suits and um, collect uh, the discharge data while she was out there as well. Um, we had Anthony was looking at the weather up there. Um, remember Al had mentioned something about you can't do biology up there. There's no biology to do. We had one student, bless his heart, he came up there. He was a biology major, but he, in his deepest, deepest desires, wanted to find biology up there. Um, and he didn't. We kind of warned him, or Al, Al warned him, said, you know, Dave, I think you might need to change your research question. But Dan, Dan, Dave was, David was uh, determined to get some cores and take them back to his laboratory and to find some kind of biology in, in, in the cores. Um, uh, we had another student um, that was looking at snow melt, and he was using an interesting mapping program, one that I use with my students called ImageJ. And so he was able to use the software to quantify the change in um, the snow along the side of the, one of the hillsides there. There was another student looking at um, the sedimentation, another one that was looking at um, where the sediments come from um, as they go into a lake. Um, another one was looking at magnetic reconstructions using sediments again. And another one, last one was looking at the ice cores. And he was using, he had gotten samples from the ice cores. Um, now, actually, it wasn't the bacteria in the sediments. Instead, he was looking at something a little bit more macroscopic. Um, but I don't believe he found anything at all. OK. So just uh, um, just again, just to emphasize that being out in the field and being around all these students um, is just a, another way for you to, or, and for you to read Dan's, Dan's experience with these kids, just another way for you to find out what other types of research questions are out there and how these can actually be turned into classroom applications. OK, back in the classroom, before I went on my trip, um, I actually did this activity with my students with, by Bob Odo. And it's just a, it's an exploration. It's using a mapping tool. Um, using a mapping tool to, to kind of give the kids a sense as to what it's like to be in the polar regions. And this is one that I had put together, and I believe it is on the Polar Trek website. And it's um, using data from the Global Snow Cover um, uh, Lab in Rutgers University, Dave Robinson's um, office. Um, and what they're looking at is uh, the change in snow cover. And you can, there's wonderful data sets here. You can look at daily, weekly, monthly products. Um, and you can look at change over time. You can acquire the data in tabular form, or you can grab, uh, uh, gather the data in graphic form and ask a bunch of research questions related to the data, and then use the data to answer those questions. OK. Um, one of the, another one of the labs that I have posted um, on the uh, Polar Trek website is the one from the North American Glacial VARB project. Um, now, VARBs are a phenomenon where th that occur at the glacial lakes. And so um, it just so happens that in New Jersey, we are at the southern point of, of one of the, of the, from the last ice age, from the Wisconsin. And we actually have one or two lakes in the northern part of the state that actually have VARBs in them. So, um, I don't know that our data has made it onto their website, but I know the, the professor that's in charge of this website was interested in coming into New Jersey to gather some data. So what I've done for you in this um, activity is I've selected three regions that, where we had data that was um, collected um, that at, at for the same time period, and from that um, created an activity that actually explores the data over time and had the, ch the thickness of the bar of layer layers over time and compare that to temperature. OK, so this is just to kind of give you an idea of how um, uh, VARB scientists use VARBs to reconstruct the past. And you can see when you look at the way these pieces have been put together, it's almost like you're doing dendrochronology and using tree rings when you're trying to repeat, recreate the past. Um, you just kind of match up your, your cores. And, and you can see you can go back deeper and deeper into time. 
Okay. Um, and then this one, these are a suite of 17 new activities that were created um, by the, the, the team at um, Windows to the Universe. Um, and it's just, it, they go with, each one of them goes with a video. The videos were created by NBC Learn uh, from an NSF grant. And NSF or NSF has charged NBC with coming up with a five to six minute video clip about the most recent global climate change science. And so these are 17 different areas of global change science. Some of them I bet you didn't even think were, you know, we need to think about. Um, so when you look through these lessons, you're going to see that there's um, uh, quite a few that uh, will fit into the polar regions. Um, so one of them, let's see. Um, let's see, I want to get back. You can do double click okay. on the slide if you want to go back. I know, I'm, I'm all set. I'm working actually off of a couple different screens here. Okay, one of the, the, the four that I think I, I, I kind of identified that would fit in and may help you maybe think of an idea for a capstone activity. Was the, one was the black carbon, because I think there, that was mentioned in um, one of Dan's um, slides. He was talking about the, the changing albedo of the polar regions, and you know. I don't know, but I didn't even think black carbon was an issue. But if you take a look at this five-minute video clip and then look at the subsequent activity, you'll see that the activity is very doable, but the science is is just phenomenal, and it, it's like it's it's an eye opener. I think. Even all of these little video clips will be eye openers for for everybody. Um, there's another one with melting glaciers. That's kind of like a um, a glacier then and now type activity. It's related to the changing um, landscape as the glaciers retreat. And what you need to do is you kind of need to match up the the right glacier uh, before and now. Um, there's also a mathematical component with that, where you actually measure the rate of change of the glacier um, over time. Uh, one, I found this data set, actually I'm, I'm one of the contributors to these lessons, I found wonderful sets of data on permafrost uh, available through, um, I think it was the University of Alaska Fairbanks, as a matter of fact, and they, there's a wonderful network of permafrost stations throughout the whole uh, state of Alaska. And so what you're going to see when you look at the permafrost activity after the little video clip is a, a real, some real data that was acquired from, um, from these stations. And what I want you to do is take a look at how the, the change, the, the permafrost changes with, over time, uh, the depth of the permafrost changes over time with the data sets there. And then finally, the last one is the fresh water in the Arctic. It seems like we're almost opening up a dam, and we're allowing for some fresh water to get, in, get, get, in, get out of the Arctic, um, or excuse me, get into the Arctic, and that's actually going to change the whole dynamic of how the Arctic um, uh, works and the plumbing works up there. Um, so those were four that I thought would be germane to um, the, the capstone classes and the activities that you might be doing in your classrooms. But please take a look at all the other ones. I think you're going to find that the lessons um, are, are closely aligned to the video clips. Um, and for my biology students that are, or excuse me, biology teachers that are online, there's five of them that are specifically, five or, or maybe even closer to seven, because there's a couple that are crossed between the geosciences and the biology. Um, there's a, up to seven of them that you might find readily available for your uh, biology classrooms. Oh, there we go. And then finally, um, the biggest thing for me is, looking at the time here, um, I think we have a little bit of some, some time here. Um, the, the biggest, my biggest um, focus as a teacher is to get my students to do science. Um, many of them um, can do school very well. Um, but how many of our students can actually do science? And so what that means is for all of us to be well grounded in the practices of science. That's what makes Polar Trek so unbelievably special. Each one of the scientists that's in the field, whether it be an REU student or whether it be Al or Mike or Steve, every single one of them that goes into the field has some kind of research question that they're trying to get answered with the data that's being offered to them in the field. I think this is probably the most creative science that's out there looking at the, the science of the, of the polar regions because you know, it's, it's not like you can pick, take a little sample and run it back to the laboratory. You've got to think on your toes when you're out in the, in the polar regions. And beyond that, you, know, you also need to be thinking about the elements and um, how are you going to work with the elements to get to the answers to your questions. Okay, so um, over the years I've been doing these long-term research projects with my students um, where the students actually have their own research questions. 
Let's go next. Ah, okay. Um, just to kind of emphasize the importance of doing actual science with kids, um, the, uh, the, the state standards mention it, the national standards mention it, um, the next generation science standards are intimately entwined with them, and the NAEP frameworks, the 2009 NAEP frameworks also mention that the practices are in, 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 in integral to science instruction. Um, in general, so most of us, or not most of us, but, but some teachers think that because their students are doing hands-on activities, moving paper around on their desk, they're doing inquiry. Well, if you think about, again, how a scientist goes about their work, perhaps that's not quite inquiry. Um, sometimes the, the, uh, the inquiry is taught as a separate course, and so there's just as few cadre of students that are um, doing these re research projects and getting to Intel or one of those big competitions. Um, but that doesn't have to be. All of our students can do their own research projects. And, but, you know, again, it's a challenge for a lot of us because as trained educators, that perhaps we never did do science when we were in college when we were being trained. Perhaps we took um, some, all of our courses ended with uh, taking a multiple choice test at the end of the course. Um, we are very fortunate if we were the type of science student in college that actually was given a project to do um, and really learned how to do science. Okay. Um, and so, so just to kind of reiterate what I just mentioned, most undergraduate science classes are taught as lectures. A college labs are generally based on objectives rather than student-generated research questions. Um, and then the best coach is one that's, that, that is one that has, is somebody that has experience. Um, so these RETs, such as, as the Polar Trek program, uh, research experience for teachers, are fabulous opportunities to get that experience. Earthwatch was a wonderful place to get experience. Uh, Teacher at Sea is another place to get experience. Um, working with a scientist in a laboratory is another way. Um, and industry, um, as well as find, if, you're, if you're located near an industry, that's another way of, of latching on to somebody as a mentor um, to learn about the practices of science. Okay, but are your students ready? My point is, yes, they are. They all can do science. But they need some scaffolding because, you know what, it's probably something they've never done before. Um, so um, I take the first marking period and I break up the practices of science into each one of these little, uh, into this list that you see here. And we actually do many activities related to this knowing that this is just the introduction and then these are built into all of my labs and all of my lessons during the course of the year. So I have that little mini activities I do for each one of these. If you're interested in them, um, again, you can email me and I'd be happy to share them with you. Okay, so what does this look like in my classroom and how can, it, how can you try this out? Again, I mentioned first marking period. We have a four marking period year. First marking period is devoted to just getting the kids used to being in a science room and acting as scientists and focusing in on the practices of science. The second marking period, um, I have them submit a proposal. And this is, includes their um, research question as well as their hypothesis, their background research, and um, p a potential stab at some methods. Third and fourth marking period, we do data collection. Fourth marking period, uh, data analysis and report out. Um, the coaching students and selecting a topic, turning it is, uh, oh, um, the, one of the big things of getting the kids motivated for doing this is getting the kids to find a topic that they're going to embrace. And what I've got here is just a kind of a schematic, and I have this on a PowerPoint slide with animation, so it kind of comes in slowly. And I use this with my students. So if, uh, the bubble on the topic is their favorite Earth system science topic, and of course I tell them they have to have one. And then I go down one side of the tree or the other. Um, so first off, I tell them, you know, you need to think about the, your time. How much time do you have? Many of my students are athletes. They're involved in so many different activities. So perhaps they don't have time to go out in the field and collect data. Well, there's a lot of options they can do if they don't have time to go out in the field. One of them is, and that would take them down the left side. If they like to go into the field, they have the time, then they would go down the right side. Okay, so an online project if on the left side, let's go down that first. Um, so with that, they have to choose um, between learning how to use a data tool, like many of the tools that um, are in the Earth Exploration Toolbook. Um, my students use a lot of those chapters, by the way. Um, and another, or another thing they can explore is data, different types of data. Okay, if they're going to explore a tool, well, is it a model or is it image analysis? And so the idea here is for them to learn how to use this tool, but use this tool with their, another set of data to show how it can be used by scientists. 
Going down the data side, they have an opportunity to use either archive data or real-time data. There's a myriad of real-time data sets out there and a plethora of archive data that's out there for the, for the students to use. Um, again, I'd be happy to share any of these with you. Um, now, if the students like, they want to go out in the field, which I always am tickled when they do because that's my favorite is to get out in the field. Um, they have uh, the opportunity to um, collect field data and compare it to online data. A lot of my weather students will do that. Or they can collect all field data. So that would be my students that will actually collect water samples and do water quality testing or actually do some in the school building type testing. Um, that's the field as well. They have a choice between doing a longitudinal study or just to do an initial field assessment to kind of give, perhaps set up a, 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 um, the baseline data for a students for subsequent years to collect some data. So this graphic is just a, a way to kind of help students out with coming up with an idea because that can be a little bit of a challenge for them. Okay. Um, now, after the proposals are submitted, I conference with each one of the students about their methods, their question, their hypothesis, everything. We usually sit for about 10 or 15 minutes and talking about what they want to do. And then I make a copy of the proposal and return it, to, um, the original, to the student and mention to them that they're going to need to make the changes and update it before they start collecting data. During the third, second and third marking periods, or third and fourth marking periods, I, I schedule all the students for what are called brown bag lunches. And here, I group the students by similar type projects. So for instance, if I have a group of students that are using image analysis, they'll all meet together, even though they're from different classes. Uh, if I have students that are, are collecting field data using um, visiting water bodies, um, and they're from different classes, they'll meet. And the idea here is for them to bring their data and to compare their data with their different students in, in their group and talk about it. And it allows me to meet with a number of students at one time rather than trying to catch up with them, each one of them individually. And it's also a great way for the students to see what other students are doing and to ask questions if they have any questions about their uh, projects. Uh, the second brown bag lunch is students are required to bring their revised proposals. And so all those changes I suggested that they make, they need to have them done um, by the time they come to the second brown bag lunch. Okay. Um, at the end of the data collection period, um, what I do is I, I devote a period to students um, on how to plot data and use different types of, of methods. Um, the students, because there's a variety of projects taking place, not all of them are going to use Excel to plot their data. Other ones might be using um, perhaps a, a GIS program or something along those lines. Uh, but we'll spend at least one class period doing that. And then the kids can come in and visit with me later. Um, you know, one of the things um, students, I think they have a challenge in identifying trends in data. Um, this is where that, that ugly graph I showed you in the beginning of, the, of this time together um, would fit in. There was an awful lot taking place there. Students might see maybe a trend in one of the lines but totally miss one of the little hiccups here, one of the little hiccups there. You know, there's all these little nuances in the data that the kids just might mix unless they're coached on how to do that. Um, so a lot of this, in, in, and by the way, I'm doing this with ninth grade students. Um, um, a lot of this, they, they need a lot of hand-holding, but you know what? They get it. By the time we get to the end, they have gotten, they have developed such a wonderful research project, all of which they can be so proud of um, at the end. Okay. Um, so why do I want to do this? Well, I want the students to gain confidence. Students to gain confidence in their abilities to do science. Um, students practice their metacognitive skills while they're reflecting on their efforts and their understandings. Here, um, they build an epistemological perspective. In other words, how we know what we know. You know. Um, so we go back into the field of the polar trek up to Svalbard. We got all these things happening, and we're starting to answer some questions. But the big thing is how we know. How do we know what we know? That kind of makes us want to think, well, how are we going to get that piece of information if we don't have the answer to that question? So students start opening up their minds to start thinking a little bit different on how to answer those questions, how we know what we know. Um, it's not just because the textbook says so. Um, from a teacher perspective, well, you're teaching students um, how to do science and not simply do school. And I'm also learning, I learn tremendous along the way. So it's not only reflective of my students, but it's also extremely reflective for me. 
And so some of the things to think about, money for supplies. Um, grants is a place to get some money. Um, we have um, the um, Chatham Education Foundation. Um, I also applied for and received a grant from, um, uh, from NSPA from their um, Toyota Tapestry. So that's a place to get a huge grant. Um, to get support from your administrators, perhaps ask your administrators, um, what would you like studied in the building? A lot of our schools are going to be in school green buildings, so perhaps a student can study paper usage. Uh, perhaps study, a student can study water quality coming out of the fountains. Um, I had one student this past year looking at the thermal qualities of, of the doors around the building, uh, the thermal qualities uh, in, the, in the classroom. So if you get your administrators on board, um, that might even help propel you into getting a maybe a little bit more funding. Um, so it, it, the kids sometimes come up with topics I have no idea how what the, what the science is behind there. So I'll bone up a little bit, but um, I try to find a mentor for my students the best I can if I find that I'm lacking um, in, a, in a topic area. Um, it can be a challenge finding 70 different so di projects if you have that many students doing them at the same time. But it's also kind of um, it's, it's fun. I would say it's, it's fun. Bottom line, it is fun. Um, not only do in the last Last thing is here, there's, you're going to have student issues. You can have vacations, illnesses, supplies, web data. But you know what? That's what science is all about. How are we going to get over these little hurdles? It's all, about, it's all asking it for the same reason. You know, we're all wanting to learn to do the best science. And hiccups are part of science. OK. And that wraps it up. I um, hope I gave you some insights on some things that you can do for your capstone um, activity, or perhaps some things you can just take right back to your classroom and do with your students. Any questions? Um, yes, yeah, so going eager, back to I'm looking at some of the questions um, over here. Eager, um, yeah, I'm starting to see the questions over here. Um, let's see, is this the one we have advanced studies program that is now required? I'm going to push the students. Uh, no, let's see example. Um, so just I, um, dum -dum -dum. Let's see. Examples of examples of projects. Oh, examples of projects, sure. Um, so um, one student was looking at stormwater drains. So we have um, an area of the, of the community called the Great Swamp. The Great Swamp is a great place. It's walking distance. Uh, a lot of the kids have their homes nearby. So what he would do is look at storm drains that are emptying into the Great Swamp and look at water quality at the storm drain plus at locations in the swamp that uh, it, from the streams that go into the swamp. Um, along, I'm thinking water bodies now. Um, we have a number of small lakes. I have a number of students that are looking at uh, lake turnover um, within the lake. Um, and so they're actually, I have a thermocline sensor from PASCO, and they lower that into the lake and get temperature readings um, along the way. Um, I send home some students with waders, and they actually go into um, other lakes and get temperatures um, in lakes and measuring the size of lakes, actually, with the freeze up and thaw. Um, on the online, I have students collecting real-time stream data from the USGS um, and looking at that. The USGS also has water quality. And if you can find a stream that actually has water quality um, along the stream, then you can actually look at perhaps uh, what is it that's changing the water quality. Um, and using a data tool, give you for instance for the data tool. Uh, after Katrina, the, the NOAA posted a data tool where the kids actually map um, or actually watch what happens to a, um, a, 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 a spill. What happens to a spill if the winds were moving in this direction? What happens to a spill if it was moving in that direction? So the student, instead of doing the, the um, uh, golf, the golf area where the spill actually took place, she tried it in Long Island Sound. She applied the same data, data tool to Long Island Sound. Um, going back to the Great Swamp, I had, uh, um, we have an education center there, an environmental person there, and she came up with a project of looking at invasive species. So the kids were counting uh, Rogusa Rosa, Rosa Rogusa um, canes um, in different locations, in dry areas of the Great Swamp to the uh, wet areas. Um, so that just gives you a, a little bit of a taste of some of the things I could do. I'll we'll probably go on and on and on. Um, if, again, if you're, you're interested, I'd be happy to communicate with, with, with you more about them. Um, as far as so equipment goes, um, oh, go ahead. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Okay, I see. Um, I, I'm looking at the list of questions here. Let's see. So raise your hand. Um, equipment. Let's what is the level of expectation of a research in regards to the scientific knowledge of a teacher who might be interested in partic participating in actual field work? Um, well, in this case, in looking at the Polar Trek, uh, those guys have the uh, website, the REU website. And so what I did, uh, well, first off, one of my passions, I have um, uh, a grad degree in physical geography, and my focus was uh, climatology. And so one of my passions is, is, um, is, is pro using proxy data and for, for to understanding climate records. So this was an absolute perfect fit for me. Um, what I would suggest is look up the researcher in Google Scholar um, or perhaps put a topic in Google Scholar and bring up some of those, the most recent research in the field of that particular type of science, and that will give you enough of a background um, to, to be able to be conversant with the scientist um, as well as perhaps ask, you know, how to ask the right questions in order for the scientist to assist you in understanding the background information. That's great. That's great. Thanks. Um, oh, so the brown bag lunch is just the, the brown bag lunch was just um, the kids come at lunchtime with their their lunch because they don't have time to go to the cafeteria to purchase it. So that's all. Okay. Does anyone want to ask a question live? You can raise your hand. You can raise your hand if you'd like to. Okay, oh, ahead. there's a question. Keep plowing with. Keep plowing with. Okay, I see one about assessing the projects. That's an excellent question. So um, every year, as as I do these projects, because I've been doing them um, probably for the past 15 years or so, um, my, mo my the model of how I do this and introduce it changes a little bit. And so, um, um, so it, it, I, I'm hoping it's getting better and better. But I use a rubric, and the rubric actually changes from year to year. You're more than welcome to have uh, the doc if you'd like. I can uh, send it off. It just send me again. Send me an email. I'll share whatever you'd like. But I have a rubric that's very strict, and so it's therefore when it comes to assessing student work, um, and you're doing a lot of them, it's not that onerous of a task. Perfect. Hey, we have a question from Sue, so we're going to let Sue go ahead. I turned off your mic for a moment, Missy, so that Sue can talk. Go ahead. Are you there? Are you there? I had to turn Missy's mic off one more time. Go ahead. Probably Sue, press probably the talk, press talk, button. talk button now. Oh. All right. Yes. Now, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, my question was, did you have any choice on which research project you went on? Uh, it seems like you sort of get selected and then you're put together with a scientist or with a researcher and then you did the research on that area that they're doing. Is that correct or did you need to know a lot ahead of time in order to be selected in the first place? Um, I, um, for in my case, um, I actually interviewed with two different scientists, and then I was selected by Al and his team. Um, I think what the, the important thing here is that it's a fit. It's a fit between you, your background, um, your interests, and and the work of the scientist. Um, because if you're going to be working with the scientist in the field for X number of weeks, and it's going to be up to six weeks, um, there has to be some kind of a fit. So they try to do the best they can to make a match. Uh, between your interests and your science and and that of the scientists. And then Janet and um and Sarah, you want to add to that? Um 
I, like I said in the um, in the comments earlier, it, it really depends on the research project and what the researchers' expectations are and everything. And so that's that's uh, something that we go through. If you make it through the final process and um, and you get to be interviewed by a research team, which is one of our last steps towards being matched up with the team, um, you can you can find out what it is they are expecting and what your you know, if there's anything special you should need to know and all that kind of stuff. And and really um it goes beyond the what you know as far as science. It's it's all about personality and working on the team and as Missy said, finding that close match and that fit for a teacher and a researcher. So uh, um there's a lot of questions. I know some of you are very interested in about the Polar Trek program and everything and, and um Missy's experience and how she got selected. As I mentioned earlier, we're having a webinar on Thursday about how to apply to Polar Trek and what to expect and to address actually some of these very questions. So I encourage you to sign up for that webinar if you want to go out on an expedition. Um, if you can't make the webinar, it will be archived and um, you can always email Sarah me about questions as well. I just added the link there if you need it for uh, learning all about that part. Um, this might be a good time for us to kind of draw to a close. I see some people typing, so let's see if there's any more questions that come. Uh, I think Sue is typing a little bit, so we'll let her teach you her that come. Um, great, thanks, Sue. And of course, teachers do as many different ways for all of us to be a, a part of the Polar Trek program. Um, Missy, is there anything else that you did want to add before we come to a close here? Um, no, thank you. Um, it's just other than it was a pleasure joining all you guys, and I'm, I'm really enjoying following the class as well. Um, you guys have some wonderful resources that you're sharing, and it's, you know nothing better than teachers coming together to to find out where the, all the best resources are. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, and Sue was just asking um, if we have Missy's email address. Missy, do you mind if we send that out with the archive to the participants? Oh, she just sent it right there. That's perfect. Yeah, so thank you, everybody. That was a really, really fruitful discussion, and I hope it continues with our online class and archive out to you shortly. Yeah, thank you, Missy. It was great to uh, hear your voice and a uh, really great presentation for uh, for uh, Betty and Betty and I. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Janet. Good night, everyone.